Hello and welcome to episode 57 of Linux After Dark. I'm Joe. I'm Chris. I'm Gary. And I'm Dalton. Welcome back, chaps. Dalton, you've got a question for us. A lot of us have been around a lot of communities, and for a while in some of our cases. What is the earliest memory, though, you have of a positive interaction with a community? Now, if this was your earliest memory of a negative interaction with the community, I would have quite the list for you. But it is actually relatively hard to find my first positive memory. Uh, It's very sad. I'm sorry for you. I find it hard to pinpoint exactly one specific thing. But I was thinking about this. The thing that I do miss is the slow pace of communication in online communities. Because if I think back to the things I would interact with, one of the strong memories I have is of copying PlayStation games and there being a forum to sign into to interact with people. And basically, people were just helpful. (laughs) Like The idea of trolling was there, but because it was slow-paced, unlike now where people can just ping, 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 ping all day long. It's always possible to reply and the person to get the reply. That is one of the things I miss more than anything is posting something and operating at a slow pace, turning your machine off and then picking that thread back up the next day. Well, yeah, when I first had the internet, it was dial up. And so I would sign into the forum and open a bunch of windows, I think it was then, not even tabs of the threads I wanted to read and then disconnect, read all the threads and type out all my replies, reconnect, send them, (laughs) and then disconnect again. And yeah, it was very much asynchronous, not like today with Discord and Telegram and, you know, modern stuff like IRC. (laughs) (laughs) See, that came later when I got broadband and I was connected all the time. And uh, I had some mixed experiences with IRC, let's just say. So I didn't actually join any communities until I had quote-unquote high-speed internet. I think it was 128k. So it was after dial-up days, so I didn't have to be disconnected all the time. It was through some cell phone Verizon 1X. It was slow, but it was reliable. But you had to have the phone connected to the computer to do it. So if someone wanted to use the cell phone, they uh, had to take it. So I agree, having that ability to disconnect and think about what you received was really important. For me, I found my first place at a game engine forum. And it's not a big game engine. It's still one that's running today. The forum is long gone, though. But I'm sure it's on archive.org if someone wants to stalk me in the past. Have they recently changed their terms of service? Nope, it's not (laughs) Unity. It was a little thing, and it had a flowchart-based programming model that just really clicked with me. I didn't make any good games in it. I don't think many people do. But the interaction that I had with people where everyone was really helpful and... I mean, there were forum games. So if you want to count to a million, let's start at one. Here we go, everyone. (laughs) Or the (laughs) massive off-topic thread that was just a stream of consciousness that even then could only support itself at about a one, two messages per per minute, that was about as fast as chat went on that PHP bulletin board. So I agree, having that slower pace of conversation and in that case, really good moderation and pretty good community management, I think that's really what set me up for being able to build communities the way that I have been able to, with plenty of help, of course. And I think that was really important and formative, just completely formative for me. I think you hit the nail on the head with moderation, though. Mm. If you don't have good moderation, it quickly goes to shit. I was thinking about this with X, Twitter, Twat, whatever you want to call it, and Mastodon. (laughs) Bird-chan. That's what I'm enjoying about Mastodon. It took me a while to get my rhythm with it. And I don't post a lot on there, but in terms of what I consume, I've now curated my feed into something like what I used to feel about Twitter, The problem with Twitter now or X or whatever, it's so algorithmically pushed and pulled. If I look at one thing once that someone sent me on a different messaging platform, that's it. The feed for you, especially the algorithmic feed, will go off in all these weird directions. It's not moderated for the content and everything. And Mastodon is now fulfilling 
the same spirit that we were just talking about. I've managed to get it to a point where it's topics I'm interested in by people that are generally nice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there have been some dicks that I've seen on Mastodon, but I've just blocked them, which you can do on Twitter, but that has changed. You know, we don't need to go into that too much, but you know, there was a time when Twitter was cool for me, man. I very, very rarely saw anything that I didn't like. And then Musk bought it and it went to shit and that was the end of that. And then I moved over to Mastodon and it's been broadly the same. It's easy to curate. There's no algorithmic stuff happening and it's a pretty welcoming community. I mean, I've had some reply guys recently and I just block them. <laughs> Move on. No problem. I think that's still different from what we had, you know, in forum days with bulletin boards, because the people who were on a bulletin board were self-selecting, and you didn't hear from anyone who wasn't on the board. Yeah. Mm. So I think that's a really interesting combination of things that Mastodon has that are kind of like bulletin boards, kind of not. Well, the thing about the bulletin boards that I was part of was that they were very small communities. There were only... 20 or 30, or maybe up to 100 active posters on there. Mm -hmm. And that meant that it was like that sort of village feeling where everyone knew everyone else and you couldn't get away with acting badly. Well, I think that's sort of the point that I checked out of most online communities, to be honest. If there's over about 50 people and I don't recognize the people that are posting, I just sort of check out because there's just feels like there's this constant fighting to have your voice heard. That was something that I really noticed while we were building the UbiPorts community, is that we would always try to have smaller places to post. And it wasn't necessarily to get away from people or hide decisions or anything, but just to have a small focus space where us, the people who we considered friends and coworkers, could just talk about stuff, which was rapidly lost when the community started to rapidly grow. So we had to kind of curate that ourselves. Well, it's like how we have the private groups for these shows versus the public groups. But you have the same at work, right? Like I've got in my work a channel for people globally, a channel for people in EMEA, a channel for people in the UK and Ireland, and then one for the team that sits under my manager. And I think by far the most active one is the last of those. People are just more comfortable in smaller communities, I guess. Yeah, it was very interesting, actually, because I recently came back from the Ubuntu Summit. The first people I met were the people responsible for the Ubuntu Discord. And one of the things they asked me is, why don't you join? And I said, well, A, I am literally at notification overload, to which Popey and Wimpress were like, oh, I just turn them all off. I turn every single <laughs> notification off or everything. <laughs> and uh, it notifies me if I'm at it, otherwise... That's it. I'm not quite like that. I, I selectively mute some notifications. But it's also because I have, I've joined the Sensible World of Soccer Discord and I found it so, I felt like an old man, I have to be honest. <laughs> well, the main problem there was that you joined Discord. <laughs> yeah, there are entire communities I'd left because they moved to Discord. Just no interest in it at all. I know you're young and use Discord, Dalton, but I find it baffling and overwhelming and I feel like what I was with is not it anymore. And what's it is Discord. Puts on sunglasses and that's why I have to use Windows. <laughs> <laughs> well, you make me feel super old, Joe, because I feel overwhelmed that our work Slack recently had the Giphy plugin enabled. And that's too much for me. <laughs> <laughs> I've set it to hide all of the GIFs and not play the animations. I just want text. But GIFs are for old people now. Like I spoke to a very young person that I know and asked, are GIFs cringe? And she said, yes. At least you worded the question correctly. Well, I'm down with the kids, Don. Oh, <laughs> I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this episode is sponsored by people who support us with PayPal and Patreon. Go to linuxafterdark.net slash support for details of how you can support us too. Linux After Dark is part of the Late Night Linux family, which means that for $10 a month on Patreon, you can get access to an RSS feed that contains all the Late Night Linux family shows without adverts like this. There's also an option to get just this show ad-free for $5 a month. Some of the episodes are even released a day or so early for Patreon supporters. So if you like what we do and can afford it, it would be great if you could support us. 
at linuxafterdark.net slash support. I really enjoy visiting the OpenWRT forum because it has everything that we discussed. It's small, it's subdivided, you know, there's a hardware section, there's a device bring up section, there's a little off-topic section. That is what I like. I like a slow pace, divided up a little bit, and not too much sensory overload. It's largely just text-based, like the ZFS Discord that Jim has set up, which I've joined. I'm lurking. Discourse, get it right. Discourse, sorry. Yeah, you see, I I am an old man. I can't even get the name of things right anymore. (laughs) Yeah, Practical ZFS, that's called. Practical ZFS, exactly. It's just text. I mean, yes, you can embed images if it's relevant, but most people don't. There'll be backticks, code snippets, and things like that. But I enjoy that, just like I prefer reading a blog post than watching a YouTube video on the whole. That is how my digital mind has developed. So when I go into Discord and it's just ping, 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 at ping, 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 group, group, channel, ping, ping, ping. At everyone. Ah, yeah. I just feel old. Suppress at everyone is there for your enjoyment, not everyone (laughs) else's. For large Discord servers, it is very difficult to get things tuned to the point where you see what you want and you don't see what you don't. At least on bulletin boards, you know, it was like, here's your channels, here's the different categories, and you have a custom icon on each one, so you think, okay, I don't want to look at those ones because I don't like them. But on Discord, it's all just, hash the thing. Thanks. And you can't reorder them Mm. yourself, that's for admins to do. Um, Or maybe you can now, whatever. And there's too many emojis in uh, Discord, I don't like that. Well, that's where you're wrong, old man. (laughs) No, in my day, you did a colon and a bracket for a smiley face. What's wrong with that? Why do you have to have little pictures? <laughs> <laughs> this is where you just send us the table flip ASCII art thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that was creative. Like, it, you know, you had to work it out sometimes. What was the thing? And like, you know, a bracket, an underscore, an eight, a bracket. Yep, yep, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> a pipe and another bracket. And you've got Homer. Like, you know, that was like... Back in the day, that you had to creativity. Now it's just like, oh, I'll just click this button and it's, you know, a picture of some shit. You know that Discord has slash table flip, slash unflip, and slash shrug for all of those old emojis, right? Uh, no, I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that because I'm in zero Discords. <laughs> to turn the tables, though, I wonder what people that like Discord think about the things that we like. Yeah. Are they looking at bulletin boards and forums and thinking, God, this is shit, isn't it? Well, I don't think they are looking at them because (laughs) they almost don't exist at this point because Facebook just ruined that whole thing. One of my earliest positive memories of a community was a small movie forum where we talked about like obscure films and stuff like that. And then eventually that just died as people moved over to Facebook to talk about that stuff. And so now the only real forums that are left, well, there's some guitar ones and um, lots of tech ones and stuff, but they're just far fewer than they used to be. I guess there's some tabletop RPG and niche interest kind of things as well. Things kind of move to Reddit and then they move back out as Reddit does something bad and then they go back in. Mm. For Discord itself, I mean, for all the real-time chat platforms that we have now, it is just really fast. And I think the solution that most people have is just being in smaller ones. Even ones the size of the late-night Linux Discord, plug, plug, can kind of be overwhelming. You see all the people in the online, you're like, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to say something bad here. (laughs) Someone's going to kick my ass. Yeah. Well, one of my favorite Telegram groups is the group that used to be for System AU, which was an Australian Linux podcast. And now there are 10 people in there, including me. And so it's very slow. Sometimes there'll be days go by without anything. And then some days there'll be like 100 messages or whatever. But again, it's a much more welcoming, relaxed atmosphere in there. You do realize you've just ruined it, right? Well, no, because there's no one can find it. Uh, You'd have to like find the right person to be let into it, I think. I guess what's happened is what you said, Joe, isn't it? What used to be a series of bookmarks for different forums in a different format with a different topic, they've been centralized. And yes, a lot of that centralization is kind of fragmenting. For Reddit, people have tried to recreate it with Lemmy, but 
I don't think that's quite the same. Twitter and Mastodon are not the same thing, but it hasn't gone back to that fragmentation. And I can distinctly remember opening, I mean, even before browser tabs were really a thing, we're going back a long time, just having different windows open for different forums and visiting them one by one and not knowing about the idea of having one platform that put everything in one place. And that's what's changed. And we've kind of come out in the wash somewhere. But, you know, I really miss PHP BB and having to set 777 on certain directories to make it work. (laughs) Oh, if only we had known better. (laughs) (laughs) But there are some Linux communities that are pretty toxic these days. I don't want to name any names, but like it does come back to who's in charge and the moderation. And even small-ish communities can be really just horrible if the people running them are dicks. Right. Good moderation really needs a kind of person who is a certain kind of (laughs) up-themselves, such as me. Um, (laughs) Because you need to be a little bit idealistic, but not so far up your own ass that you can't see daylight, if I want to say it like that. You know, you need to have good ideas of how people work and interact with each other and opinions on how they should do that. And you have to enforce those opinions, but not too much. It's a really weird balance. Yeah, and I'm not very good at that. I just ban people really quickly (laughs) if they just say anything that pisses me off. Well, that's kind of what I've moved towards too. Yeah. And I think that ultimately that is just the way to do it, probably, if you personally want to have a good time, but maybe not for the greater good, I don't know. A while back, I read a post, and I don't know if I'll be able to find it, but it was by someone who ran a large online game. And I can't even remember what kind of game it was. It's something where you start a web page and click a button to make a choice, and then you keep doing that for years. And it built up its own community, including a lot of people who didn't want to be there anymore. And the post was all about, you just need to get rid of people who don't want to be there anymore. They're not having fun. You're not having fun. They're all commiserating and not having fun. Just get rid of them. Ban early. One of the worst aspects of communities are the people who are just a drag on it. And they don't do anything wrong. You know, they don't necessarily insult people. They don't use any offensive words. They don't spam links or anything. But they just drag it down like an anchor. And you feel bad for wanting to get rid of them until you actually do it. And you feel a bit bad for getting rid of them. But then things improve. The mood improves. People stop just disappearing when that person or those people start talking in the community. And we did an interview with John O'Bacon about this years ago on Late Night Linux. And it's something I've really struggled with. At what point do you just call it and get rid of someone? For me, it's transitioned to very, very early. It's a constant challenge, isn't it? And even if you have multiple moderators, eventually it's going to be a reflection of the human beings that those people are. And as you say, Dalton, you you have to have a specific way of thinking. And there are people that are good at it and there are people that are bad at it. And it's certainly something that is a skill and some people lend themselves to it more effectively. And I think that's what's always a difficult thing because it's going to come in ebbs and flows. And for ages you'll think, okay, this is kind of chugging along nicely. And then Every community will have difficulties at points, and that that is when the moderation kicks in and when it can sometimes be hard, because you have to try and take a step back a little bit, but also keep your head. So I, I really admire anyone that has to do it and doesn't lose it and is patient and manages to keep it going along. And while we're on it, that does lead to a lot of burnout in people who need to moderate and manage online communities. Mm. I can raise my hand here. (laughs) So if you're in a really good community, give back any way you can. Right, well, we'd better get out of here then. We'll be back in a couple of weeks, but until then, I've been Joe. I've been Chris. I've been Gary. And I've been Dalton. See you later. (laughs) 